backed up, I jumped and I shot him right then. I shot him. When I shot him, he hit the floor. Peace, um, you know, um, I want to tell a um, testimonial story about kids with guns, right? But before I start, I want to shout murder out. I want to salute my brother, right? And may he rest in divine harmony. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, we're going to get to the story. Boom, um, you know, one night, one, it was in the fall, in the beginning of the fall, one night we was all standing outside doing what we do, right? And a, a car came through our block, right? Shooting everywhere. Shooting everywhere. Bullets was whizzing by everybody. And we all got down. Some of us made it to my door. We all wind up running in my in the house, like eight of us. Now what year was Had, this? Now, now what year was this? This was 89. All right. So we run, we run in the house, you know. I grab my joint. Some of, some of the other brothers grab, guard you nails, grab guns. And we go outside to see who is that shooting at us like that, right? Well, come to find out they was chasing three young guys from the neighborhood. One of them was a new guy that lived on our block. They had been robbing people. You know what I'm saying? They had been running up on people with this big samurai sword, robbing them, right? So someone chased them down and shot our whole block up. Shot everybody, shot at everybody that they saw. So we're going, at this time, I didn't know what was going on. I just went to see who was shooting. We wanted to see who was, who was shooting at us like that. So we all strapped up. And when I got to the corner, this is the corner of um, Vernon and Tompkins. When I got to the corner, we didn't see anybody, but we see these three young kids. I know two of them, but the other guy I don't really know. You know what I'm saying? But he was with them, and my cousin started questioning them, like, what's going on? And one of them start telling like they shooting at us. These guys are shooting at us. And when, when we got into it, when he got into why they were shooting at him, they told us that they had, the kid been ro had been robbing people. You know what I'm saying? They didn't say with what or how, they was just robbing people in the neighborhood, right? I didn't know this kid, but I knew the other two kids from the neighborhood, right? Mm. Anyway, they had they some words exchanged or whatever, right? I got my hand on my gun, cocked, ready. It's in my pocket, though, because somebody had been shooting. You know what I'm saying? So I'm ready. I'm looking around. I'm not paying them any mind, any attention. So when I turned and looked at the kid and went to go get closer to him, him and my cousin was having words. When I got over there, I was like, listen, sure, sure, you can't do that shit over here. Can't be robbing people on this block. He backed up a little bit. My cousin pressed up on him a little. He backed up and, and pulled a uh, samurai sword out. Backed it out like he was going to slice one up, slice my head off. You know what I'm saying? When he backed up, I jumped and I shot him right there. I shot him. When I shot him, he hit the floor. He hit the floor immediately, but it, there was no blood. So I didn't even know if I really hit him like that. Then I looked and he had a hole in his side. He had the sword out already or he had the we had the he sword? He had the sword up like he was getting ready to chop our heads off. He had the sword jacked back. You know what I'm saying? I I think it was almost like a reaction when I shot. Now, at this time, it was a lot of gunplay in the neighborhood, and I wasn't new to um, pressing up and giving it to a nigga. You know what I'm saying? But this was something where people was walking by. It was a lot of people outside. This was something that I would have never have done. And I'm going to say this, that 
me talking about the sword, I don't want to be disrespectful and I'm not glorifying it and I don't want to show any disrespect to this guy or his family because it was something quick that happened. We were both young and wild and I'm really, you know, sorry the situation happened. It affected my life tremendously. You know what I'm saying? It really turned my life around where I'm still feeling the remnants of that now. But anyway, you know, he jacked the sword up. He was going to cut my cousin. I believe he was going to, I don't know for sure, but he jacked the knife up. He was mad. He was mad and he jacked the knife back like he was going to cut my cousin. I could have, I always questioned myself, should I have told him to put the sword down? You know what I'm saying? But when I seen it, he, he pulled it back and I let off. I let off I was going to give him another one, right? But he hit the floor so hard, I didn't know whether he was faking or, or you know, what was going on. Anyway, I looked down at him and we cleaned the, the scene up. We cleaned the, um, we cleaned the whole corner up. We hear him, which we shouldn't have, while people were walking by, some people heard the shot and they was looking, but we took the sword out of his hand and, get, and hand it off to somebody. That was my first mistake. Secondly, there was a housing police at that time, there were still housing cops. They were housing police, police must have heard the shot and was coming down the block. I walked right by him with the gun in my hand. He asked me what's going on. I said, I think somebody had a seizure down there. You know what I'm saying? So I make it to the rest or whatever and they come back and tell me that the kid, he's gone, he died. You know what I'm saying? So now I run a little while. I run, you know, I, I go to family house. I even stayed in Brownsville a little while. You know what I'm saying? But I went up to a bunch of different places trying to run. And finally, when I thought the heat was off, I came back. You know what I'm saying? Around the way. As soon as I touched down, right, I was with this guy that, you know, he was hot. He was selling drugs or whatever right on the corner. So when they came and grabbed him, they grabbed me too, but they let me go. So they were looking for me then, but they didn't know how I looked. You know what I'm saying? They grabbed him when they got him to the precinct. He told them that was him right there that you grabbed. You know what I'm saying? So they came back and stuck, um, you know, staked the block out. They staked the block out. And while I was trying to tell, <clears throat> I was trying to tell one of the guards, one of my brother, um, who I thought was, was telling on me and who was there, they grabbed me. The, the homicide grabbed me. They took me to the precinct and they started interrogating me. They interrogated me almost 15 hours, right? But at the end of the day, what I didn't know is that they knew what had happened. They knew the whole story, but they wanted to twist it and, and make this fake motive and fake narrative that me and the guy had a beef over drugs. You know what I'm saying? So they interrogated me. Sergeant um, Anthony Renzini, and I remember his name because I filed a complaint against him. This was around the time when Central Park was, um, the Central Park Five was on trial. Um, Yusuf Hawkins had got killed at this time, around this time. At least when I was going to court for that case, his court was in, in um, his trial was in, in court. Anyway, they interrogated me and this officer, Sergeant Manzini, smack, was smacking me across my face. He handcuffed me and took me to a stairwell in the precinct and told me he was gonna kick me down the stairs if 
I didn't stop lying. You know what I'm saying? They did everything to me. But, um, you know, they didn't really want to put no marks or bruises on me. So it was one cop that played good cop. It was another cop, Officer Renzini, that played bad cop. And he really hated black people. He called me every nigga you could think of. He choked me. He did, you know, he tried to put fear in me enough that I would tell, but I wasn't raised to tell. But what I did do was put myself on the scene. I didn't tell what happened and I didn't give, I gave a statement, but it was a total lie. You know what I'm saying? Which I know now that you don't give a statement, you just ask for a lawyer. You know what I'm saying? But I gave this guy a statement. I said that I walked by and I saw the ambulance. I saw the guy laying there and that he was alive. They asked me how I know he was alive. I said I saw the fog coming out of his mouth. He was breathing, right? That was enough for them to indict me. I didn't know that. Mm. But you cannot put yourself on the scene of a crime. If you're if you put yourself on the scene of a homicide, then you're indictable. The grand jury process, there is no defense attorney. The defense attorney cannot even speak in the grand jury process. It's solely made to, um, you know, to um, um, prop for probable cause. It's solely made to for the di- district attorney to bring probable cause to go forward with your case. Well, anyway, um, they interrogated me. They took me down to central booking and because they, this is the way they justified bringing me back to the precinct. They said that it was so crowded that we would have to sleep in the car. So they took me back to the precinct and interrogated me for like eight more hours. You understand? So now, they're trying to put a motive in my mouth, a motive in my hand, or whatever. Fast forward, the two guys that were there with this guy with the samurai sword, I never, I didn't know the guy with the samurai sword, but he had moved in an apartment on my block, but I didn't know him. He was brand new, and I guess he was trying to impress, you know, the other guys in the neighborhood, how wild and crazy he could be, but he wound up running into me. And how, you know how what old, I'm saying? How old was you again at this time? I was 18. And he was like what? He was 18. Mm. He was 18. You know what I'm saying? And um, the two guys that was with him were a little bit younger, maybe a year younger than us. I'm going to give you one of the guy's names, but the other guy, I feel bad about. But there was a guy that was with him named He was a car thief. He was a guy that I really didn't like. I never liked sneaky motherfuckers that climb in people's cars and shit like that. He wasn't on drugs or nothing. He was just a little thief. And I later found out that he was a informant he was a rat and he had rape cases and all type of shit on his record. Fur- furthermore, right now, he's on Facebook mean drilling and pump faking like he's a real motherfucker and he's a rapist, you know, um, snitch, a rat bastard. The other guy I'll call A. He was just a young brother that got caught in the mix. You know what I'm saying? And he tried to run when when we went on trial he tried to run run he went away ran to new jersey and the fugitive task force on the day he was supposed to testify brought him to the court building in handcuffs so that's the way they railroaded him and threatened him to put him in jail and all type of you know whatnot but um anyway this guy lied for them but what he did do because i was out on the street and i was able to make bail he um he was spying on me for the da 
right? And I had to keep these guys alive. You know, but it looked in most cases, brothers will be trying to get rid of their witness. But I was too smart for that. I knew that they were waiting for me to um, harm one of them. In fact, I made sure nobody looked at them hard. For two years, I was on the street. For almost a, a year and a half, I was on the street before I went to trial. And I had to keep these guys alive. Instead of letting them get killed, so they won't testify on me. I had to, I wind up having to keep these two guys alive because they were waiting, they were baiting me. You know, I would see them with detectives. This guy would walk and pass my house while, while the trial was going on. He would stand in front of my house. As soon as I would have threatened him, they would have put me back in jail. So what I did was make I rocked him to sleep and made him think that I understood that he really wasn't a snitch and that he was forced into this situation, right? He wound up giving me the kid's coat. You know, the kid had a jacket and what was significant about the coat is they switched coats so the kid could carry the sword because it had a belt in it, on it. So, and then the, the hole in the coat showed the trajectory the trajectory of the bullet. So it showed that his arms was raised in a swinging motion, right? Mm -hmm. So they gave him back the coat and told him to get rid of it. He told me, and then I told my lawyer what was going on, my lawyer, Frank Gould, who I owe my, you know, my freedom to. He passed re recently, may he rest in peace. But um, he told me to see if I can get the coat. Don't put myself in harm's way, but see if I can get the coat. The kid gave the coat up and made me promise that I wouldn't let anybody hurt him. People was threatening him and, and telling them, you know, he. what I didn't know then is that he was a snitch on more cases than just mine. So he wanted me to validate him as being a solid guy and a stand-up guy. So he gave me the coat. And during the, during the trial, my lawyer asked the detectives, where's the coat at? Didn't he have a coat on? Where's it at? The detectives lied and said they had the coat and property when we had it. So the... um. My lawyer would put each detective on the stand and ask them about the coat over and over. And over and over they lied about the coat in front of a jury. Also, what was significant in this case is that I had, you know, when you're young and, you know, you, you have a lot of selfish thoughts and selfish things going on in your mind. What, um, what brought my attention and my consciousness to how har harmful I was hurting my family? There was a day during discovery where my lawyer said, we're not gonna do anything tomorrow, but pick the jury. Everybody don't have to come because my whole family would come, come to court with me, right? This lawyer, um, Franklin Gould, he was a genius. Right? But when you're doing cases, trial cases and murder cases, um, it makes you a little indifferent and callous, right? So this, on this one particular day, he told my family they didn't have to come and no one came but my mom. So when you're picking a jury, you're picking from a jury pool of like a hundred people, right? The courtroom full, my mom was sitting in the courtroom behind me and a hundred jurors came in the courtroom and sat behind and in front of and on the side of my mother, whispering and talking and, it's, and um, looking at me and pointing at me while my mom sat amongst them and they didn't know that that was my mother. And I turned around 
and looked at my mother. Even now, it, it kind of, you know what I'm saying? But it touches me even now. I turned around and looked at my mother and she was sitting there trying to hold a straight face while she was in this room with a hundred people pointing and talking and um, gossiping and saying things about me while the jury put on it. I mean, while my lawyer and the DA explained what the case was about and it made me understand the effect and the um, trauma it brought to my mother. You understand? But um, that made me um, understand the seriousness of it because when you're young, you don't understand the full gravity and seriousness of your actions sometimes. Although I was justified in the homicide and I was justified in front of the court, right? I wasn't justified because when you hear shots, you stay, you're supposed to stay in the fucking house. You know what I'm saying? And I chose to grab a gun and go outside. And that's why all of this happened. And I know that, you know what I'm saying? But I was young and I was stupid. Well, anyway, back to this guy and, and A, right? A, I know his whole family. I spoke to his family. I told his brothers, do you know your brother is testifying on me? Do you know your brother made statements against me? I'm showing his brother's paperwork. They are, they are surprised, like what? You know, what, are, what do we need to do? I said, you need to get him from out of New York. Send him away. You know what I'm saying? They, my, my lawyer gave me the videotape and the audio tape statements that they made against me you understand and it was very negative and it was none of it was the truth of what happened then there were anonymous phone calls from people that walked by and people that witnessed the crime and people that seen me walk away you understand but um to tell you how corrupt and um callous and um defunct our justice system is they put on the stand my lawyer not only twisted all his words and made him tell that we had the gun i mean that we had the coat that the guy wearing and why they switched coats my lawyer also put um made reasonable doubt because he got to say that he had a gun in his pocket. You understand? So when he questioned him, he said, did you have a gun? So he told the jury, how do we know he didn't do it? You know, there were other people shooting that night. How do we know that he wasn't shot already? Right? So I had reasonable doubt. He told me, my lawyer told me that I didn't even have to say I did it because he already proved reasonable doubt. But because the kid's family and everybody, my family, everybody knew what happened, I wouldn't do that. I, you know, I still had a certain amount of integrity and I told them what happened. Everybody told me, don't take the stand. Don't never be a witness in your own trial. Never take the stand because you're opening yourself to cross-examination right so I had a decision to make as a as a um, young man you understand and I made the decision to tell the story and as I told the story I looked his mother in the face his mother and his sister came to trial every day I looked his mother and his and his sister in the face and I told the story I told what happened, you know, and the DA tried to rattle me and he laughed at me. He asked me, how do I feel about what happened? I said, I feel terrible. And he bust out laughing in front of the court. Anyway, did such a terrible job that when they sentenced me on the gun, 
They acquitted me of the, the homicide, but they sentenced me on the gun. They gave me a year and five years probation. At that time, that's what you would get for um, criminal possession of a firearm in New York. I think now it's three years, but at that time, you can get city time for um, weapon. So they gave me um, a year on the island. Do you? They put in my house. The DA had moved to my housing area, right? So now I'm in a position where they're trying to make me kill this guy or harm this guy again. You know what I'm saying? Because they're all telling the um the district attorney and the detectives that I'm no angel that I have shot people before. And when they tried to get other people to witness against me, they wouldn't um, speak against me unless they were put in witness protection. So they were telling all of this to the court. And he was telling the, um, the detectives and the DA that he was scared of me, that he feared me. He did so terrible and he folded and stumbled so bad in the court the district attorney, I mean, my lawyer got him to say that, to confess to another crime on the stand. He had broken to this woman's house and was chasing her around with with the gun when the landlord came in and caught him. You know what I'm saying? So my lawyer got him to confess to that crime on the stand. The district attorney, when I got sentenced and I got housed on Rikers Island, the district attorney put him in my housing area, in my house with me and gave me paperwork on everything he had done and tried to set me up to kill this guy again. What I did was kept him alive again while he was in my housing area and I sent him I had him sent to the other side. I was on the B side. I opened the sprungs. When those sprungs first started on Rikers Island, I was in one of the first ones. They had high impact like the um, shock program over there in the sprungs. And then they had regular general population guys over there in the sprungs because the um, that building was busting at the seams with people. Right? Anyway, they brought him down there and I told I showed the police my paperwork and told them that they trying to um make make us kill him. You know what I'm saying? A cool um Spanish po- um officer just told me, move him, he said, and we're gonna light his ass up. The police told me we're gonna light his ass up on the other side, and that's what they did. They moved him. There was some guys from the next block from me over there on that side. They knew he was an informant also because he had told on somebody else in the neighborhood. And they got him over there and lit his ass up. You know what I'm saying? They ran him out the house. You know what I'm saying? I think, if I recall, he got stabbed in his ear real bad. Like in his eardrum. You know what I'm saying? And I had nothing to do with it. They couldn't put it on me. And um, that's how that went. But I feel bad about the other guy that he was put in a situation like that for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I also want to say that this system is corrupt at its core. The, the, um, the justice system in New York is corrupt at its core. The, the prisons are filled with innocent people or people that were in incidents just like mine, and they got 25 to life. You know what I'm saying? It just so happened that we were able to uh, retain a good lawyer. Had we not had that lawyer, like I told you previously, the, the, um, the lawyer told me he could get me a deal for eight or nine years to sit tight. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of times people are scared to go to trial because of, you know, the time they're facing. But you have to learn the law and you have to know the law. 
I'm not saying I was an angel after this incident. It just made me worse. This incident made me worse as far as gunplay and as far as um, being in the street. If I was threatened or if if someone um, I thought was a threat to me, I went ahead and did what I had to do. You know what I'm saying? I didn't wait or, or you know, wait to see what your move was. And I wasn't no shoot a thousand times guy. I was a one or two shot guy. You know what I'm saying? And hopefully I won't have to do that again. But I'm so um, distant and far from that life that it's hard for me to tell these stories now. But I need to because it did therapy for me. And I appreciate you, lads. I appreciate you for um, inspiring me to tell these stories. And also murder inspired me to tell these stories and say, Quan inspired me to tell these stories but I want to put uh, uh, emphasis on the, the system and what it did to us and at that time the streets were corrupt people could sell um, you were able to sell drugs with impunity until um, jump out day let's say so the streets were full and I had to defend my family and defend my sisters. And ultimately I became proficient with the gun, with firearms, you know, just to protect my family. You know what I'm saying? I lost a lot of brothers. I lost a lot of sisters too, to um, gun violence. And with that, I want to say peace to murder again. I want to say um, love and blessings to his family. And he was an inspiration to me. You know what I'm saying? And may he rest in divine harmony. You know what defense that my lawyer used? The, get, the Bernard Getz defense. He cited that case to get me off. The Bernard Getz defense. Because they, the, the law is if you... If you can run, if you can um, leave, then it's not self-defense. So they cited Bernard Getz case. Mm. So, so that's, do, do you remember Bernard Getz case? Yeah, where he shot the people on the train and all of that? Yeah, yeah. He got the same, he got the same sentence that I did. A year and five years probation. So my lawyer kept citing his case. He said that my lawyer explained to me that the difference between justice and injustice is money, it's rich and poor, and they're not gonna do that to you. That lawyer right there, yo, he's a different guy. He's a different kind of guy. And he was only like four nine. He had to wear high heel shoes to, um, you know, when they call him to the bench, Hmm. He couldn't see over the bench, so he wore these big high heel like boots, so he could see over the bench. Hmm. And he he taught me, he groomed me for for trial, and he would put his hands on me and hug me, and he said, "I'm not gay." He would tell me, "I'm not gay," but these juries have to know that you're human because they've been taught to through the media, taught through the media that young black guys, young inner city guys are animals. Mm. So he said, this is the reason I'm touching and rubbing her. You he, used to do that, he used to do that in the courtroom, you mean? In the courtroom while we were on trial. That's, that's in front true. of the jury. And he was an Italian dude? No, a Jew. Oh, he was Jewish? Franklin Gould. He was mm. Jewish, right? And his his um law firm was in the world of in the Woolworths building, 61 Broadway. 61 Broadway, his partner is down in DC. But he was old man, he was an old man. He was an old man and he kept, he kept asking me. He said, did you leave anything out? And as the trial went on, me and him got to become friends. And while the jury was deliberating, he was crying. He said, because sometimes 
they will um, go the other way no matter what. He said, that's why I didn't want you to take the stand and say you did it. You know what I'm saying? And when they let me, when the jury came back not guilty, the um, it was this white jury, a young girl on the jury. She was twisting her hair and rolling her eyes the whole time. And we were saying, she hates you. She's definitely gonna um, vote guilty. After the trial, she came, she brought me a hamburger, threw me a pack of gum and hugged me and told me to go live your life. Mm. When I, I almost went, man, I almost, when I was speaking about my mother, I almost started crying. You understand? So it's as many as years as that was ago, it still touches me. It still touches me and it still reminds me that there are guys going through what I'm going through right now. You understand? It's guys, it's guys like murder that been in and out the system. We were, the environment made us who we were. As soon as they wanted to stop crime in those neighborhoods, they did it. They did it. They, the house that I grew up in is on the market for $1.6 million. Look at, look at 197 Vernon Avenue. That's the house I grew up in. That's the house I was born in. It's on the market for $1.6 million. We had to fight them Jamaicans off our block. We had to shoot Maine and couple them motherfuckers to get them off. They came in droves selling crack. And they would not, you know how it is. You live in, you live in Brownsville. I ain't gotta tell you. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, um, it's real how the 80s was. So you saying, see, a lot of people don't, they don't, they don't know anything about the New York 80s. Like, I've been hearing stories lately. Like, my man told me recently that it was the Jamaicans that was running Rikers Island at first in the in the early 80s. And That's dudes was going to war with the Jamaicans. That's a fact. Do you remember your man did that story about the Jamaican war in Canarsie? Yeah. When he was talking about... Do, do you know that the Jamaicans killed my man born master over here? You know what I'm saying? In Canarsie. There was a weed spot called Power. Yeah, I remember. You know about that spot? Yeah, I, remember. I used well, to cop from there. Well, they was going to war over there because they took over the neighborhood. They took over my block. You know what I'm saying? And they came with heavy artillery, right? But the guards, we ran them motherfuckers from off, the, off, off our block. It was a guard from some the shot. He was very militant. Very militant. And he had an arsenal. He was militant. Like, strict. He came up with Chaz in him. He came up under Matulu and, and Chaz in him. He was very militant. And he would come and, you know, the guards would roll, literally. Literally, we would have to roll. We would have to go to war. And the police, a lot of times, didn't even come. You know what I'm saying? So the place where my grandmother and my grandfather used to walk to the key food or walk to the store, they couldn't walk anymore. You understand? Because it was drug traffic. It was like um, the walk, the living day. You know what I'm saying? It was that, literally. Our neighborhoods was ravaged, and it was they were doing it with impunity and with the police sanction. The police knew everybody that was selling drugs. They knew everything that was going on. And when they got ready to stop it, they stopped it. They threw ballet in the middle of my block. Now, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Facts. They got a. They got. It's white people doing ballet in the middle of my block now. You know what I'm saying? You saying in the eight in the eighties, in the early what was that? The early eighties where you said it just started like you said the Jamaicans just started moving into the style like crazy. The Jamaican, do, do you remember that they used to leave houses abandoned, right? Back then, those brownstones, they were if if they were um, left and they were unkept, they would just board them up. The Jamaicans would come 
and make a home and make track guns on every block. Shower Posse, all of them, them gangs like that, they were in all in our neighborhoods with Uzis before we knew where Uzis were. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. So we had to, we went to war with them first. We went to war. The part of this, part of the reason why I'm proficient is because we had to go to war with them first. And I love my, you know, my his, my um heritage is mixed. You know what I'm saying? So I got everything in me. So I'm not um being um you know biased towards them, but that's what it was. That's what it was, man. And they were taking the, the, the girls that we grew up with and turning them into crackheads and all type of shit. Like New Jack City. You know what I'm saying? But only we was, you living in this, you watching it every day. Then we also, you know, I started with the, 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 um, the, the, um, the Puerto Ricans from um, Lower East Side brought dope on our block. So we had to fight them too. We made my, I'm gonna say this, I made a lot of money with them though. You understand? I did a lot of work with them. But you know, the Jamaicans was biased towards us and they wouldn't really work with us. You understand? And they were disrespectful to our communities. You understand? They wouldn't care if your mother was walking by, they would tell your sister, suck their dicks and all type of shit. You know what I'm saying? So we had to really get it, we had to get it in with them. You know what I'm saying? It came deep and look, because my family is um, mixed heritage, I had a lot of Jamaican friends and they would tell me what's going on. They would tell me that's so-and-so. They had this thing with that they used to do. They would call, some, they would call a guy to their car and blow their brains out. You understand? They would set up shop, and if they got in a beef, they would call like one a little guy that's standing on the corner, or you know a guy that they know that that's gonna hurt us. They would call him to the car and shoot him in their head. You know what I'm saying? So they had a lot of shit with them with that. You know what I mean? And then when I got in the um when I got in the jail, I started learning a whole bunch of how they was moving a lot of um, guys they killed, like my man, Born Master, they killed him. And I didn't know all how it went down, but I knew he was beefing with them like that. You know what I'm saying? The guards in particularly, cause we wasn't going for it. And we was military, you understand? We wasn't going for it, we saved a lot of blocks. That's why you got the A team and the Supreme team and, and so forth, because we had to get together you know, to keep them out of a lot of our neighborhoods. You know what I'm saying? And they, the guards was disgraceful too, I will say. You know what I'm saying? But that's what was going on. They were fighting us. You know what I'm saying? You don't wanna blaze the heat, get knocked, see haze in street, raise the blaze, don't sleep, nigga. Cuffs on a kid wrist. A lot of niggas talk prison, but I live this. Hey, Jam Pop fam, what up? A lot of y'all dudes know me from the stories, but y'all don't know that I put in extreme work on the underground, you heard? And I'm about to release 500 of my top songs that I ever recorded, cause I put in pop work in that booth, you heard? Real talk, and this is volume one right here. 100 St. Lazarus Essentials. I'm gonna drop 100 songs at a time. You heard? You're getting 100 of my songs per value. That's a lot of music, bro. And I'm doing it like that because y'all need to catch up. For those who don't know and only know me from the YouTube stories, y'all need to catch up. You heard? Z Man Suicide Polo Ski Man walking around the hood like He Man because he can't rest in peace to my nigga Murder. I love you, my nigga. Let's get it. Gen Pop. Yo, I'm getting on that phone next. Yo, see Yo my nigga, don't disrespect me, my nigga. You see Yo, me standing hey, here waiting for the phone, nigga. I don't give a fuck what you waiting for, nigga. Fuck what you talking about. Fuck what you talking about, nigga. Touch that phone, nigga. Touch that New York tale. This a true New York tale. For real, for real. The jail to the strip. 200 gangs to list. In New York. 
A New York story, names ain't used, I praise the rules Yeah, a New York tale, it's a true New York tale For real, hey, yo, rock 9-9, lock confined I 